Do you ever find yourself yearning to look beyond the obvious and dreaming about what's possible in your next chapter? Welcome to the Next Chapter Experience. I'm your host, Jeanette Blissett, former corporate executive who turned the page to become a best-selling author, entrepreneur, designer, and lifestyle business consultant. Episodes feature me and a kaleidoscope of guests who share their journeys with wit, candor, and humor, breathing life into real talks about things that matter most. I believe we all have a fire burning within us, waiting to be unleashed and shared with the world. It may just be a matter of time. So let's get together, turn the page, and get this adventure started. Welcome to the Next Chapter Experience. I'm your host, Jeanette Blissett, and today's guest is Danielle Burnock. Danielle is a childhood trauma survivor, international award-winning author, speaker, podcast host, and trauma-informed self-love coach who helps men, women, and organizations emerge with clear vision of their value, take ownership of their choices, and chart a path to their promise, becoming victorious souls. She's created courses and workshops to implement her four-step proven process called SELF, Her mantra is love yourself from survive to thrive, and she's known as that lady on the internet who loves you. Danielle, welcome to the Next Chapter Experience. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. As I shared, I did download your book, Because You Matter, and there are so many highlights that I came across. I don't even know where to begin, but here is where I want to start. October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And recently I recorded an episode where a woman shares her experience being married to a narcissist. And in that conversation, she shares a lot about her childhood and about some unidentified trauma that didn't seem to bubble to the surface until later on in life. So I related to what you were saying about sometimes we have a habit of diminishing some of those episodes in our lives, thinking it's not important, it didn't impact me, but in essence, it has. So I wanted to talk a little bit about something that I wrote down here from emotional manipulation, self-sabotage, and bad therapy to freedom. I think that's in your second season, episode 102. Can you just share a little bit of where you were coming from and what that episode was about? That episode, Bad Therapy, that was an interview that I did for my podcast with a young lady named Kim Keen. She went into therapy to get help, and the therapist actually caused more harm than good, giving her what the therapist called tools, which were really weird, bizarre things. And so she stopped that and she broke free and found her own way to freedom, just fighting her way to freedom from the manipulation of growing up and her therapy to make her do what her therapist wanted her to do instead of what she needed to do. So that's what that episode is about. Now, in your book, you do make mention of some of the personal experiences that you have had in your life as it related to just really accepting some things or just acknowledging some things. Can you take us through a little bit of that so we have a better understanding of why you're doing what you're doing today? One of the biggest things that I struggled, I didn't have a name for it when it got brought to light. What it was called at the the time it got brought to light was something went terribly wrong. Those are the words that my counselor used. I was telling her some things about how I felt about this, that, and the other thing. And she went, wait, no, no, stop. Let's go back there. I'm like, why? Because it was just my life. I didn't think anything of it. I blamed myself for how I felt about things. And it was what I've learned now is called childhood emotional neglect. It is highly undiagnosed because people don't know it's there because the whole thing about childhood emotional neglect is it's about something that's missing and you can't see something that's not there. If someone who's abused or verbally abused or beaten or an incident occurred that you have a thing to reference, but with childhood emotional neglect, it's something that was supposed to happen that didn't happen, but you were a child. So you didn't even know it was supposed to happen. So this thing is just missing. And I had a lot of that, but I didn't learn it was called childhood emotional neglect until about three years ago when I read a book by Dr. Janice Webb called Running on Empty. And she highlights 12 different parenting styles and how it could cause neglect. I think one of them is the healthy one and 11 are the unhealthy. I'm not quite sure. It's been a while. It's an awesome book. I bought the hard copy and the audible. Highly recommend it. 
And it is what helps you put yourself in the situation because how she explains it and she draws the picture using a fictitious child. This kid goes through a situation and then when he comes home, this is how a healthy, emotionally nurturing mom would deal with it. Although she talks about how no parent is perfect and we're not going to get into that. Nobody does everything right. So it's not about that. But then she uses the same child, the same situation and uses the variables of the other styles for you to go, oh yeah, that one was mine. Oh yeah. Oh, and then you can see it. And she elaborates on the side effects. This is what happens. This is what's left behind. It's the carnage that's left behind after you've gone through that. One of the big things is what she calls fatal flaw. And that's the thing that you hide that if people really knew that about me, they would not want to have anything to do with me. It's like your greatest fear that you hide behind. But there's a number of things. I have an assessment at my website for different kinds of ways. People can be traumatized and identify it because it's the side effects. It's like buying the side effects. How much does this affect your, your adulthood now? You know, these are the fallout from childhood. It's got a lot, a little, not at all, all the time. And so it can help you identify that. So that was the really largest part and the pavement that all the other things were layered upon. As I told you when we were offline, I had just reread my book, Emerging with Wings, this past week in preparation for a speaking engagement. I kept having to put it down because of the emotion it was invoking in me and marveling at how that story was brought out. I pray a lot. I'm a believer, follower of Jesus. And I prayed about that a lot because I did not know what I was doing writing that book. I'm like, God help. And I'm reading this book going, God wrote this book because this is just amazing because I don't think I had the wisdom and insight to see what I was reading this week, seeing the layering of the traumas. Mm -hmm. I suffered complex PTSD, did not know it was a thing until after I was already healed of it. Now, since I've studied trauma, since writing that book and releasing it, getting all the feedback from people that it resonated with is what has led me to what I do today. When I sat down to write that book, it was just like a sentimental journey that I was going through and I wanted to help people. I'm like, who am I? What's my story? It can probably help a handful of people. That's where I was at the time. But the feedback I got was just astounding. And one quote in that book has gone viral, which completely blew me away, but it was very validating about how trauma is personal. You can't compare it to all these other things, which is what people do and what I I was doing. But on top of the emotional neglect were bullies, public humiliations, public shamings, death, multiple deaths in my life. And when I was there for, and it was awful, my father died in front of me. He had a horrible heart attack and it was very noisy. And my mom went hysterical, which was very much not her character. I just passed the 50 year anniversary of that day. And I happened to see that day on the calendar and I actually did a live on my Facebook. It'll be on my podcast about that because I went witnessed the evidence of healing in my life that day. I'm looking at the calendar, it's September 22nd, and I clearly remember that day. I clearly remember my dad dying. I clearly remember the details of it. I clearly remember certain aspects of it, but I just remembered I was not triggered. I was not set off. Mm -hmm. I was not set off into anything else. It was evidence of healing in my life that I could remember without it hurting me. And that's where I encourage people to do the work. Yes, it's hard work. You have to revisit things in some capacity. It's different depending on what it is you got you're dealing with. And it's work. It's a lot of work, but it's so worth it. Mm. It is so worth it. And I have been set free from all those different things. Is my life perfect? No, I don't mean that at all. I still got issues. Everybody does. But those things in the past, they don't plague me anymore. As I said, I read that book again this week and a term that that I had forgot about because it had been a while since I read it. I heard myself back then. I was seeing a picture into myself and I'm so different now that it was hard to look back and see suffering person. And one of the terms that I said is I was inwardly convulsing. That's heavy right there. That's inwardly heavy. convulsing. I was so lost and I was disoriented. I was confused. I was stuck in cycles and I didn't know how to get out. Like I just have shared with my Victoria Souls community and even on a social media recently, a quote from that book that is what I call a warrior mindset. 
I got where I am today by refusing to stay where I was. I was inwardly convulsing. I didn't know how to stop. I was disoriented. I didn't know how to get clarity. I was confused. I didn't know how to make that stop, but God helped me. And I was just clawing to find a way to get healed. And I didn't even know what healed was. And I didn't know what the problem was. I just knew what all my side effects were, which were really messy. I was like, man, you were really a mess. And I knew that, but to revisit all those ways that I talk about it in the book, I just, I had to go for walks. I had to put it down and go for a walk. I was feeling that again, not in a triggering way, but in an empathetic way. I wanted empathy to have for other people. I remember, I want to remember this because I'm reaching for people who are there. I'm not there anymore. So I need to remember those things. That's something that I wanted to bring up because I have had opportunity to talk to a lot of people and many of them are sorteing, if you will, in their trauma that they've had in their life. And I wondered as you were going through your process of healing, was there a point where there was blame? Because I'm finding that that's a theme. The individuals blame their parents blame the other people in their lives who inflicted them with such great pain that even 40, 50 years later, they are still talking about it. So I wanted to go there with you. Can you share with me your thoughts about that? Oh, yes, I'd love to. I didn't have the presence of mind about that in Emerging with Wings. I addressed that actually very specifically in Because You Matter. Because blame has a place. Blame has a place because you have to identify the cause. You have to identify the cause, but after you identify the cause, if you focus on the cause, you will never get healed. And I draw the picture, and it seems maybe silly, but I'm just trying to draw the picture. Two people are standing on top of a building. One person pushes the other one off the building. Okay, so they're laying on the ground and they got a broken leg or whatever's wrong with them. So the person who pushed them off the building is to blame. They pushed them off the building, right? But you're laying on the concrete and you got a broken leg. Do you need to focus on the person on the building or do you need to focus on your broken leg? You need to focus on your broken leg. You need to focus on that healing. And then if the person who did whatever they did needs to be arrested, then pursue that. Or maybe it was an accident. Then you can deal with that causative thing. But to get stuck in blame, that's actually it. You get stuck and you'll never heal. You have to let go. You have to forgive. That doesn't mean they didn't do anything wrong. But in Emerging with Wings, the closest thing I came to that was with a mathematical equation I came up with. Because I struggled to own the childhood emotional neglect in my life because I felt I was denying my parents. Right. My parents did the best they knew how. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that because I actually have said that many times because sometimes our parents are young parents, let's just say. Like you were a young parent. I was a young parent. My parents were not young parents, but my parents, they had trauma. But as a child, I don't know my parents had trauma. My mom lost her dad when she was seven years old. My dad, he was born in 1917. World War, all that, without getting into that. But I had no idea as a child. My counselor helped me do that. The broken leg kind of thing. I had to own that I had this stuff in my life and there was the cause because my parents didn't do things that I needed and my parents did things that were hurtful to me but the mathematical equation that I got was because I stumbled over they weren't malicious they were not trying to hurt me they were not trying to hurt me there are parents who are trying to hurt but a vast majority of parents are not malicious but no malice does not equal no harm. Again, I find that the whole space of childhood trauma and accepting that, I'm just going to put it this way, our parents do and have done the best of what they could have done to their ability. They were not parents in the past. You come into the world, they are trying to figure it out and they're not going to get it right. That is the flat out reality of it. Okay. The majority of them, Dr. Janice Webb says that's the largest category, well-meaning parents who are emotionally neglected themselves. They don't have to have what the kid needs. You have their trauma. Okay. Their reality. Okay. Which unbeknownst to us is in the DNA. They bring it forward and then you experience what you experience. But my point is that they do the best that they can. Okay. And to your point, at some point, you've got to own it and put your oxygen mask on first and deal with you. Okay. (laughs) And that's where I find there's that disconnect with many people who are spending more time focused on, as you put it, the blame versus where do I go from here? 
Yeah. Okay. What's in my control? What can I own in taking personal responsibility like you did? And I always put it this way, figure some stuff out. Yeah. That's what you've done, which I have great admiration for you that you did what I call the work. Oh yeah. A lot of work. Where did that come from though? Where did that come from? Did it come from the suffering and knowing that you wanted to live free, live a better life, feel better about you? Where do you think that came from beyond divine intervention? The drive to heal? Yes. I would say two things. I would say wanting to heal, wanting, knowing, hoping, maybe just hoping there's something good. But I learned that there's a thing called trauma drive. That's actually a thing that, that the trauma itself can drive you to do things because you're running away from something else. And so I was running away from the pain. So I was like, how do we get rid of the pain? So I think a lot of it was trauma drive. I need to just get rid of this. It's just, I'm going to just not do that. Things like I had eating disorders because I'm going to just not be fat. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to just <laughs> not that. And I'm going to, that was one of my things. I had eating disorders. And with my kids, raising my kids, I'm like, I am not raising them like my parents. I may not have a clue how to raise them, but it's not going to be like that. And to some extent that can be helpful, but sometimes that can, it can get nasty. It can fall in the dumper sometimes. Sometimes it can work for you, but then people get afraid if I heal, then I won't have that drive anymore. And then I won't keep going forward. No, you'll have a different kind of drive, a more healthy one. Yeah, and that's a positive way of looking at it. And to be afraid of being free seems counterintuitive. People are afraid of being free because they don't know what that looks like. They're familiar with their pain. I'm familiar with my suffering. I know what I feel like when this happens. It feels crappy and I hate it, but at least I know. Whereas healing is unfamiliar and as humans, we fear unfamiliar things. So we need someone to come alongside us, hopefully to help us. That's one part of that quote. Is there someone to enter the pain and hear the screams? Because it talks about silently screaming inside. That's what the trauma does. It silently screams. And we need someone to come in and hear those things. What's going on? What's going on down there? That inward convulsing and to validate that and then help pull you out. There's many people who are very conflicted with the way they feel about themselves. I believe you talked about shame. It held you captive, causing you to hide most of your life. And I was curious about that. Shame is a side effect of trauma. And I have a big soapbox on no shame. Shame is never good, never. And I've had people get on my case about it and why shame is good for this and shame is good for that. I'm like, shame is never good. Shame is never good. Guilt has a place. Shame is never good. Because guilt is owning up to, I did this thing wrong. And so you're guilty of this thing. It's about the thing. Where shame is about who you are. It's personal. And shame has no place. It's like shame is a side effect of that because we blame ourselves. We tend to do that. And it was the first thing that happened in the garden when Adam and Eve, when they sinned, the first thing that happened. And one thing that I saw after that, within the last year, I was really, because I've had people get on my case about shame. When that happened, if anyone in the world, whether people believe in God or not, just think of it as story then. God makes Adam and Eve and then they disobey him and then they're naked and stuff. And he's, what did you do? And if anyone had any any right to say shame on you it would have been god but did he do that no he did not what he did is he covered their nakedness the bible says love covers a multitude of sins so if god isn't going to heap shame on someone i'm not doing it you talked about that experience after you wrote your first book and you had an opportunity i believe speaking engagement no, but this is what got me you wrote the book and then you said you were afraid that people would actually read the book yeah my greatest fear was that someone would actually read it because exactly. half of the book i learned while i was writing it and i know what that feels like somebody's actually going to read the book that i wrote oh my god i don't know if i can dig it but in that moment or maybe moments when you had the opportunity to actually speak, you had to resolve that. What did you do to get enough courage? Oh, I didn't do it. I, I recoiled. I did not. And it was good that I said no. No, oh, okay. You weren't ready. I wasn't ready. Yeah, at the okay. beginning of Because You Matter, you carry at the beginning. It's not too big of a spoiler alert, but I explained why I wasn't ready because mm -hmm. I learned why. Because I had learned and I really self-attacked because why wasn't I ready? I had emerged with wings. Isn't that the name of your book? Danielle, why, why aren't you doing this? You should be doing this. You emerged with wings. What's wrong with you? Is it all a lie? And I just attacked myself. But what I learned is butterflies, when they come 
come out of the chrysalis or cocoon, they don't fly right away. I love that metaphor. Please, <laughs> let's talk about that, okay? Yeah, so I wasn't ready. I had to go through that whole process that I talk about because you matter, that whole long process. And I had all the analogies of what I needed to do. I needed to go through a whole nother process because I had just learned stuff. It's like I had just come out of the chrysalis. I was not ready to talk to those ladies, but later I was and I got another chance and I've been there numerous times. People just don't understand. They think that the caterpillar turns into a butterfly and starts flapping all over the place. Can you talk a little bit more about that analogy of a butterfly and its wings and what it has to do actually to take flight? It has to do a number of things. If I remember, it has to go to a place where it has enough room. So it needs to get away from where it's at. It needs to hang upside down. So it needs a different perspective is how I said. It has to flap its wings. It needs enough room to flap its wings. So it needs to use its wing muscles. I didn't know that butterflies had muscles. And so uh, what I needed to do is I needed to exercise the new freedoms that I learned in that first book because they were all very new to me. I wrote that and there it is, put it out there. And wait a minute, I did that like last week is what it felt like. It was way too fresh. And then while they're pumping their wings like that, what it's doing is it's moving the blood from their body into their wings to stiffen up their wings to give their wings substance. So I needed to get these new things I had learned into every part of my being. They had to become a part of who I was. And one of my favorite parts is that the butterfly has to release meconium. When I read that, I was like, wow, wow. And for those of you who don't know what meconium is, it's poop. And how I said I needed to get rid of some crap in my life. I mean, that was right on. I read that. I was like, that is just, this is showing up the truth, okay? This is getting yep. down to the nitty gritty here, but it made a lot of sense to me when I read it. So I thought that our listeners will draw some insight and also take an opportunity to read your book. But you have several books. You've written about four or five books up to this point? Four books. Four. Two are uh, in paperback and two are only digital. Okay. And which is the most recent? Because You Matter. That is the most recent book that you wrote. Okay. Okay. Very good. So the ones in between, was it more of you working things out in between Jing with Wings and Because You Matter? What's the topic or subject matter of those books oh. in between? The second one is called A Bird Named pain. It's available in Kindle and audio. It's a short story. It's an analogy. And it was a gift to me from God. My mother-in-law had Alzheimer's. I've heard about Alzheimer's. I heard about it. But if you've not been through it with someone you know and love, you don't know. Then you've read. You don't know. It's like telling someone what it's like to be a mom. But if you've never been a mom, you don't know what it's like to be a mom. You can read all about it until you go through it. So I was going through this. I was the head caregiver for my mother-in-law in charge of all of her affairs, but she had to go into assisted living. My husband was her power of attorney, but he was working out of town all the time. So it fell to me. It was overwhelmingly emotional to me and I didn't know how to deal with it. It was overwhelming. I was pretending I was fine, but I wasn't fine. I had like a breakdown with me and the Lord and because I, I didn't know how to deal with all the different complex emotions. There was too many different kinds and I, I was being too specific with dealing with things. And he took it all and he gave me the story. I came home from having lunch with her one day, sat down at, at my computer and just wrote the whole thing. Wow. And what God did for me in that was he drew a picture of all the emotions. He gave it a visual so I could take it out from inside of myself to outside of myself. And that was the bird. And the bird named Pain, it's P-A-Y-N. It's a play on words because it's the name of a bird. But you could take all of the pain, all the emotions that I was dealing with, they were all pain. So he took them all and rolled them all up into one thing to simplify all those complex emotions so that I could process them. And that story is how that came to be. Wow. Amazing. And it's a short story. It's not real long. One person wrote a review. They didn't like that it was short, but I was very careful. So that's a short story. And I'm not in charge of how much Audible charges for audiobooks. The people who write audiobooks do not put the price of the audiobooks on Amazon. Yeah, and then the one after that, the book is called Love's Manifesto. It's available at my website for free. I have it in audio and a PDF to give to people. And it was how I formulated what I do into a manifesto 
for people when I went from, okay, I have this book and now I felt compelled to share my message because people need this. And the core of my message is love because the subtitle of Emerging with Wings is a true story of lies, pain, and the love that heals. So it's about that love. What is love? Why don't we believe it? What does it take to convince us? Very good. As I started to become familiar with you, I realized that you founded, this is called 4F Media. What is that about? I founded that to publish my book, Emerging with Wings, because when I went to publish that, I was very intentional about self-publishing because back then I didn't know about any other way other than traditional or self-publishing. And if I wanted traditional, they were going to buy my story. And then if they bought my story, then I could never own my story or change my story. It belonged to them. And I'm like, no, I'm not letting that happen. So I'm doing this myself. No clue had to learn so much to do that. But I didn't want to publish it under my name. So I created a company for F Media to publish that, not knowing where I would go after that. I'm like, maybe I'll do something else after this. I don't know. But the four Fs stand for faith, family, friends, and freedom. Because these were four things that were very important to me. And I'm like, maybe I'll do something with one of those four after this. And you have. You I know, have. You've done a heck of a lot with all of the things that you do. You mentioned that you've got several speaking engagements. You've got some workshops and courses and things like that you've put together. Tell our listeners a little bit more about how they can connect with you. I have my website, daniellebernock.com. It's B E R. N O C K. And I have a podcast, Victoria Souls Podcast. My courses are available there. I also have another website, victoriasouls.com, which focuses more on the programs that I have to offer. My program, my seven day challenge to love yourself, heal your childhood self, and the other courses. I have a 30 day book club and other things to help people do what they dream to chart the path to their promise. What is inside of your heart? So you can go to those and learn about them. I have the course are available in two different places now, but you can get to them through either one of those websites. And my books are available like all over the place. And the Love's Manifesto is available only from me for free. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because there were a couple links on your website. I sent something in and got something back from you today. You'll see my name. I have a whole free resources tab also. I want to have as many things as I can to give people because I understand a few things. When I first started thinking that I needed to do something with my book, I read an article that says every book needs a blog. I'm like, what is a blog? <laughs> so I, st I started researching that and came across a gentleman named Jeff Goins at the time and Tribrighters. And I'm like, who is this guy? And I still had trauma losses in me. So I was very suspicious about everything. So I listened to everything that he had for free. And that's how people find out if it's a good fit. Get all my free resources. Am I a good fit? Do you like how I talk, listen to my podcast, watch my YouTube channel. And then after you were like, oh yeah, I think I like this lady. Then you buy my stuff. You know, I won't do a coaching contract without a discovery session for us to meet each other. Yeah. And do you like me? Do I like you? Do we agree? Do we will this fit well? Because people don't need to spend money on things that aren't going to work. And I don't want to waste people's time. So I have that free resources tab so people can get all kinds of free stuff. I also have another tab I added well, in the last couple of months, just resources which are all different books that I have used, I have read that have helped me. They're not mine, but they have helped me. Well, those are affiliate links. I get some minuscule amount of money from them. It doesn't upcharge anything, but I, I want to serve people. I want to help people to heal. I want to help people maybe not take as long as I did because they're finding answers and tools that I had to create. It's so critical right about now or at any time, because many of us don't know we get on with life and we continue to push through and so survive versus, as you put it, thrive. We don't know any better. And there's a percentage of people who will spend the time to invest in themselves to do the work, but not everyone is at that point in their life where they even right. recognize that they're living a subpar existence. So for those who have the gumption and or motivation or inspiration to do more for themselves in their lives, those are the ones that are going to be attracted or drawn to you. I appreciate the fact that you put together those free resources because like you, I think having a discovery period of time, you know, where you can check some things out because there's a lot of talking heads and you don't know where people are coming from, your energy is and, and some of the foundation 
additional things that they might be involved in. So I think it's it's very admirable that you've done that, that you've made those resources available for people to take the time that they need to, I'm going to use the word, vet things out. It's to their benefit to do that. That's a great thing that you're doing right there. So I asked you about what's next for you. You've got an upcoming speaking engagement. You're so busy. You're so busy. I've changed my focus this year. I did a lot more writing before, and now I've been aiming more toward the speaking thing and sharing it. So I'm starting to make some headway. I'm in a program called Authors in Grocery Stores. So I'm doing that amount of book tour that I've been doing. And I'm loving that because I'm meeting people because not everybody is online and you can't reach everyone from Facebook. Not everyone's there. People act like it's the only place, but it is not. And I was going to ask you, you know, if you were doing any virtual type of workshops and seminars and things like that, or if you're going in person, where's your head at? Right now I'm liking the in-person thing, but I'm up for anything that I can make the time for. My family is my first priority. So I've scaled back on some things because my grandson is dealing with some health issues. And so I make that a priority. And if I have to change something or cancel something, it's happening because my family is my first priority. Faith, family, friends, and freedom. That's the order of things of importance to me. But speaking, I love speaking. I really enjoy doing it and doing my interviews that I do for my podcast, doing the book tour. And I'm really enjoying that. I have done the online workshops and those are easy for people, especially when you're going across distance because you don't have the travel expense. I certainly do appreciate you making the time to connect with me. Like I said, I came across your information. I sent it on to my friend because she's been dealing with her own realities and has Mm -hmm. been doing a lot of work and she's coming out of the other side. She is Mm -hmm. now coming into her own and we are loving what we see. For her, I sent her the link to your book and she said, thank you. So you just never know where your book is going to land or where your information is going to land. So thank you so much for giving us your time today. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. We will be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Ways to connect with Danielle are on her website, daniellebernock.com. Her podcast is Victorious Souls Podcast, and she makes other resources available on her webpage. So go ahead and check it out. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Next Chapter Experience. If you have already subscribed, rated, and left a review, or shared this podcast with a friend, many, many thanks. For questions, comments, or feedback, reach out to me at Jeanette Lissette at nextchapterexperience.com. We'll be back with more conversations, so until then, keep that fire burning.